Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Activity Strong Executive Edition webinar. For today's webinar event, we are providing with providing you with one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NCTRC, and NZSRDT CEU credit. To be eligible for those CEU credits today, you do need to remain on this webinar for the full hour. And at the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box. And I will also send that link to you by email this afternoon. So please be sure to check your spam folder just in case it lands there. This survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time this Thursday. Certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Friday, August 18th. If you have any questions at all about our CEU process, please email us at webinars at linksenior.com. <clears throat> all right, as many of you know, our team does believe in a world where people of all ages are respected and valued, and that is why we started the Old People Are Cool initiative back in 2017. And three years ago, we did also create the Activity Strong initiative to educate, empower, and acknowledge each of you. And I did want to just thank our Activity Strong partners today, Activity Connection, the National Association of Activity Professionals, and the National Certification Council of Activity Professionals. We are really excited to be working with so many forward-thinking organizations across the United States and Canada, and we do look forward to working with more communities in the weeks and months ahead, so please be in touch if you're interested in working with our team. And the Link Senior Technology itself, it really focuses on engagement, connection, and celebration of individuality. We are working to enhance life in senior living communities by building simple and evidence-based technology solutions to bring person-centered care experiences to older adults and their care partners. And as many of you know, we do have research to uh, back our product and the evidence base that we have has shown that our technology increases cognitive functioning and social engagement for residents, and it also decreases aggression in antipsychotic medication use. So here's a look at our agenda today. I do invite all of you, if you have questions for our speakers, to please put those questions in the Q&A section of the webinar room, and I will go ahead and send those questions throughout the event today to Liz and Justin. And I just want to Thank Liz for joining us today, and also to thank Justin for joining us today. And I am going to go ahead and hand off the slides and presentation to them. Liz and Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Megan, thank you so much for the invitation and for having us. Hi, everyone, good afternoon. Um, Justin and I are thrilled to be here and to share some of the information with you that we've been working on and a concept that we've coined to the term around building as caregiver and the um, how technology is really advancing, how we're taking care of seniors. Many of you are on that front line of that. And um, it's really exciting actually to hear about the, um, the positive impact that Link Senior is making and the evidence that um, is so clearly um, there that shows um, the power of that. I think um, we're hoping today that we can share with you um, how we're seeing advancements in technology occurring and really how that the evolution of that um, is occurring. And the and some lessons learned, I think, and as you think about your role um, on your teams, how um, you play an important role in the in the advancement of other types of technologies as well. So, we're gonna cover the following learning objectives today. We'll talk about some of the factors that are impacting technology investment priorities and the uh, technology adoption in senior living environments. We work with providers across the country at all um, levels of the organization from the C-suite to um, regional staff to 
uh, facility level uh, staff, and we um, get an opportunity to really see the big picture. Um, we've also done some research on our end as well that we'll plan to share some of uh, the impact of that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about comparing and contrasting um, how we're measuring return on investment today and how return on investment may need to change and how we think about return on investment needs to change in the future when we're really trying to assess and understand the impact and the value that technology is bringing um, to the forefront. And then we'll explore some areas where artificial intelligence is evolving, what we're seeing, how we're thinking about it, and, um, and provide some ideas for you and your teams and how to think about that for the future as well. So let's jump in and dig into, um, to first of all, start with really what we mean when we say building as caregiver. Um, this is really a, a vision for um, how we see the uh, technology, design, products, all of that working in conjunction with the physical plant of the building to be intuitive and responsive to um, the people who are living and working within those environments. And that um, symbiotic relationship and that dynamic that exists within those settings is really critical for us to, to better understand, first of all, and then to think about as we're planning for the future, how we're gonna use design and technology um, in ways that can really support the caregiving team. Let's go to the next slide, Justin, please. And I'll turn it over to Justin. He's gonna share some examples of what this looks like today. Yeah, thanks Liz. Um, so yeah, so as we think through the, the building as a caregiver kind of world, you know, I think we're thinking a little bit differently about the, the types of solutions that are in a building. So when we think about this, we're getting away from these kind of point solutions that may have a singular value um, and moving towards solutions that have impact across kind of everybody within the building. So residents, caregivers, um, just about everyone there. So some examples, I think that we're, you know, we're seeing more and more of right now. Uh, you know, one of the easy ones to think about that we're seeing in, you know, everyone's home probably at this point is just the usage of kind of voice activated technology. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, if you would have asked people about having, you know, a, a listening device in their home, everybody would have turned it down. Uh, but now that we know we can get weather and sports scores and other things out of it, uh, you know, people have Google Homes and Alexas and things like that all over the place. So we're seeing that start to come in. Um, we're seeing the, the integration both from a clinical standpoint of having kind of voice activated support. Um, as well as the resident standpoint of being able to, um, you know, get things on demand, be able to interact with the environment um, just through voice, whether it's turning on lights or, or calling for assistance or, you know, understanding what's what's for lunch today. Uh, you know, all those things are, are options that are out there. I think, you know, beyond that, we're starting to see, you know, more and more of, I'll, I'll say the application of some of the, the artificial intelligence, um, things like, you know, machine vision cameras. So, you know, we're going from cameras that were just security cameras that, you know, you have a video feed to some back of house to cameras that are actually understanding what's happening within a building. Um, so whether that's looking for, uh, you know, people that are at risk of wandering um, or it's looking for things like falls and other things within the community. And, and how are those things identified quickly, communicated to the right people um, and done so in a manner that doesn't necessarily feel like people are being monitored or watched, right? Um, you know, smart flooring is, is one that I think we've seen more and more. So um, how do you understand the difference between someone walking through a space and someone who fell? Um, and so, you know, putting these sensors and whether it's in the floors and the walls and in cameras or anything else throughout the building and being able to bring that data together in a way that allows us to, um, you know, both operate the building more effectively, um, as well as understand what's happening from a both clinical and, and resident perspective. Um, you know, one that, you know, we've been looking into recently that I think is a pretty good example of this kind of passive idea is the idea of circadian lighting within a building. And we'll talk about it a little more later, but, um, you know, this whole idea of, you know, we've, we've all understood for, for quite a while that the lighting in, you know, that surrounds us every day has an impact on how we feel, how we live, how we sleep. Um, and so starting to see some of those things make their way into, you know, more of the healthcare settings where when you think about someone who's in a building for, you know, most of the day, um, what is the impact that that has on a person? And if we change that lighting, um, it would change the impact that it has 
what's both the immediate as well as kind of the downstream impacts that we can see uh, and are truly kind of measurable. So just some things to think about through all this, you know, with the, uh, towards the end, we're going to talk about how artificial intelligence plays in all of this as well, um, taking all of this data that's coming in and helping us to, to make sense out of it. So one of the things that we want to get uh, this group, who is, is clearly very active in chat, um, you know, one of the things we want to get you guys thinking about now is, you know, how have you seen engagement in technology and maybe just technology overall change the way care is delivered within your centers? Um, so, you know, think about this one and kind of as we go through, we're going to come back to this question towards the end. Um, and we're really interested in, in your insights. Um, you know, we think that this is one that, you know, technology has traditionally been kind of underserved uh, in, in this world. Uh, and we're starting to see a, a real application and comeback of that. So this is something to kind of have in the back of your head as we're as we're moving through these slides. Justin, thank you. And I'm interested to hear, um, I love how engaged everybody is. This is really cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why. Why, why we care about technology, why it's important for us to, uh, why we spend all this time talking about it, wh why we're investing so much in this idea. Um, and we use this kind of simple thought that kind of sums up where our very complex world that we live and operate in and in the senior care world lives today. And that really comes down to this thought of, you know, in the future that technology will be a must have not a nice to have. And over the last decade or more, we've had that opportunity for senior care providers, I think that have really either had the means or the um, incentive or the motivation to try and test out and start to adopt technology in their space. Um, in the future, um, tech will become more and more an essential part of um, everyone's world in how we're providing care and services. And so, uh, we really need to stop. We've stopped at our you know, to think about this on our team to to think about like how do we how do we approach this and how do we understand the problem. We can go to the next slide, Justin. This is a severe, really sobering statistic, and um, and I think to get to something tangible that helps us understand um, how things will be changing and why this is important that we're investing in the, in this now. Um, data from the U.S. Census uh, indicates here, and I put this graphic up here, that our future will have more people over the age of 85 and less caregivers. Um, and so in 2022, that ratio of working age adults um, was estimated to be, um, uh, working age adults to those over the age of 85, sorry, was estimated to be around 31 to 1. Um, by 2060, it's estimated that'll be 12 to one, meaning we're gonna have less people that can actually provide care, caregiving. And for those of us that will be in those positions, like myself, um, that will be on the receiving end of care um, and at an age where I will need help and, and resources, what will that world look like? And how will technology play a role in that? Both the tech that I enjoy using um, but, but perhaps even more importantly, the technology that my caregivers, my family, my, um, the places where I'm going to be living, how that will be set up in a way that I can maintain my independence and I can do the things that make me happy and, and have a, um, a life uh, worth living. And so we think we're thinking about that a lot. Um, we know that the uh, research shows us that the population, the overall health of our population today, um, and the technology that exists today means that people will likely live longer, um, but not necessarily um, will be more healthy. Um, and I think that technology can play a big role in helping us um, evolve and transition into a, a time and space where we will hopefully be healthier and have the ability and the means um, to have more equitable uh, care available for more people as well through, through the power of technology. So, um, so this is kind of our, our why and, um, and what really motivates us as we continue on this work. We can go to the next slide, Justin. And Liz, before you continue, we did have a question come in, uh, and this is from Michelle, and she said, is there a way to assess a building ahead of time to make sure that systems will work? 
For example, our firewall is blocking our ability to use a more modern digital monitoring system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Michelle. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll, I'll let Justin answer that question a bit more too. Um, some of that is um, existing challenges with infrastructure today that'll have to evolve and change. Um, but some of it's identifying tech that can work within that environment today as well. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into um, a little bit later into the session. Yeah, and I think one of the big things that I would call out there is um, even in, as we think about, you know, one, there's buildings that are existing today. Two, there's buildings that are, you know, being developed for the future. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is making sure that you have the appropriate stakeholders in the room when you're having these technology conversations. Um, so one of the things we see is like, you know, is is clinical uh, in the room when we're talking about technology needs and and what the uh, infrastructure is going to have to support. Um, that's a, that's a big piece. But uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. So. Mm -hmm. You know, to Liz's point about, you know, here's what we're going to see in, in the U.S. over this kind of 40 year span. Um, here's one that I, I, I like to show that, you know, this is not just the U.S. problem. This is obviously a worldwide problem. And uh, Japan is one that's dealing with this right now. Um, I am, a, a, I guess, a technophile. Uh, if you if you look at my background, an engineer and, and into all things tech. So this book of, of robots won't save Japan was one that was super interesting to us talking about the, the kind of aging population there. And so over this, a similar kind of 40 year span, you know, we're looking at it from, you know, in 2000, one out of every 160 working age adults in Japan was employed as a senior care worker, right? So this is about 20 years ago. So if we look about 20 years from now, the government anticipates that, you know, that number of 160 to one um, is going to have to basically change to one out of every 150, maybe 10. Um, well, you know, the answer here, it's actually 10. So to care for their aging population, one in every 10 working age adults uh, is going to have to be employed in senior care. And so that is a, a tremendous shift uh, you know, for this industry. And so one other thing I like to, to throw out when we think about this is you know, in 2012, that spending was about 740 billion uh, in Japan. And by 2040, it's expected to be about 1.9 trillion. Put that in perspective, the U.S. military budget for all of 2019 was about $734 you know, billion. So we're talking about these huge increases in costs that are going to be, have to be taken on you know, by the government to take care of this you know, aging population. So you know, as we think about, you know, we're getting ready to, to take on this change. We're thinking about these new solutions that we can bring into our building. Um, you know, what, what other things do we need to be thinking about um, and, and the kind of the, the what's next. One of the things that we run through a lot when we have, you know, um, you know our customers in and we're, we're doing these deep dives into their problem sets are, all right, you, you know that there's this problem that you want to take on, but have you actually gotten down to the true root cause of the problem? So a lot of times we're trying to put solutions in place. You know, we find that people are trying to put solutions in place to address a, a symptom and not necessarily the root cause of a problem that they're facing. And so one of the things to do is to you know, bring in some outsiders, um, bring in people that, that aren't living it every day, who can start kind of questioning things, things and, and asking why. Um, but once you kind of get down to that, yep, this is the thing that we want to, to have impact on, now it really becomes like, do we have a plan on how we're gonna actually measure that impact? Um, you know, I'd say historically, there's been a lot of, well, we're gonna put something in place, we're gonna see how it feels, um, and then, you know, six months from now, we'll determine if this is something we want to move forward with or not. Well, like, how do we make sure that we have a plan around that? Um, as well as, you know, what other factors should we consider? So the question that just came up was a perfect one of like, is our infrastructure actually set up to support this technology that we want to put in place? Um, what is the what is the change management that we're going to have to deal through deal with with all the stakeholders that are actually involved here? Um, and will the solution actually solve or just change and maybe shift the problem to some other area? Um, so these are all questions that we really run through with folks when we're, when we're kind of thinking about these things. So I talked about the whole idea of, of lighting before, and I'm going to use this as kind of an example of, of progress. So, you know, if we start with the, the incandescent light bulb at the, at the beginning of this phase, you know, eventually we move to fluorescent. And really the driver behind that was more kind of energy and um, 
you know, impact on workflows than anything else. It's an easier technology. It lasts longer. They don't burn out as much. Um, it gives us maybe more consistent lighting. And so, you know, that kind of pushed us into that, that first phase, I'll say. You know, now what we're seeing is we're seeing people move kind of from fluorescent lighting to LED lighting. And when they're doing that LED, we're seeing them start to look at the, at the circadian piece of this, of, all right, can we put lighting in place that will actually change intensity and color spectrum over the course of the day? So first thing in the morning, we're going to get that brighter, bluer light. Um, as we get into the evening, it's going to be a little less intense. It's going to be a little warmer in color. And what is the impact that that can actually have? You know, we've seen, you know, impact in everything from sleep quality, which is a pretty straightforward one, um, to everything from falls to pharmaceutical usage and, and others within communities. And so, you know, we're seeing this transition happen. And, you know, that was all based kind of on impact now, right? We're going from one type of lighting to another, and we're focusing on the impact that that can have within the building. As we look even further forward, and we're starting to see some, you know, solutions start to pop out here, now we're moving from kind of this passive impact to, you know, I'll say direct active impact. And so on the right side um, is a solution that is, is just starting to kind of make its way to market now. Um, but it's a lighting solution that also has um, sensor networks built into it. So it can not only do that kind of lighting intensity change over the course of the day, but it can also do things like look out for falls, um, have two-way communication into a room. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing the, the application of some of these simple things within a building change over time to provide more and more value to all the people within the building. So the value to the caregivers, the value to the residents. Um, and so, you know, these are things that, you know, circadian lighting is pretty well, pretty well established, but we still haven't necessarily seen it take off in, you know, in our communities. When we get to these AI configured lights, like that's probably going to take even more time um, to truly kind of make it in uh, to scale within these communities. But we have to think about what it is today and what we want it to be several years from now, as we think about the capabilities and the impact that it can ultimately have. Justin, we uh, we yeah. have a comment slash question from Martina, and she said, you know, is there a way that there can also be um, a better use of natural light and how would technology play in that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, in, in general, you know, everybody wants as much natural light as possible. Um, but, you know, as we think about it, um, you know, building design, we're certainly looking at the application of natural light. Um, how do you get more light into the, the central, you know, areas of the building? How do you get more light in resident rooms? Um, we have a, a group that we work with internally that is all, all about kind of building design and optimization and talking about, you know, how we design resident rooms from, you know, moving um, common areas from inside the building to the outside. So you get that natural light, you know, put your bathrooms on the interior and, and other things. You're optimizing the natural light that your residents can actually have. Um, and from a technology standpoint, um, you know, I think that there's probably a, a path for both. Um, if you think about a lot of your staff within the building who's walking through central corridors or walking through the central parts of the building that maybe don't get as much natural light, if you can mimic what's happening outside, um, maybe it's not exactly the same, but you can have, you know, a little bit of that impact uh, as you're starting to kind of move forward. Great question, though. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass it back to back to Liz. Uh, and we'll right. do a little back and forth as we talk about all these different factors that are kind of impacting investments. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I love the, that question as well. And I um, agree, Justin, I think the, you know, the impact of natural light and you're right, what we are seeing from a design perspective, um, we're seeing more um, designers that are understanding the value of what they call evidence-based design. And that's exciting. I think when, if you get an opportunity to be a part of either a renovation or a, a new build with an organization, if you find yourself in those, those positions, those are excellent uh, points to bring forward and to make sure that the design group that you're working with um, understands the importance of that as well. So I'll just put a little plug in there, is that your perspective on these things, um, don't assume that the, um, the developers that you're working with get it or understand it. We've, we find ourselves doing a lot of education. Our teams do a lot of education with other builders, other contractors around these ideas. And, um, and so don't, don't be afraid to bring those ideas forward. 
I, um, I want to talk a little bit about some things that we've been learning inter internally through some research we've done externally. So we, we've done some research with um, nurse executives in senior living um, over the last couple of years. And this has been an area as a nurse myself, um, this is an area that I've been very interested in better understanding how nurses um, are th and nurse executives are thinking about the role that technology can play and what the barriers really are to um, implementing those, those, um, those things. And because their role is so broad and expansive um, and the responsibilities of caring for residents, the outcomes for those, um, the care delivery processes, um, the focus around person-centered care, um, dealing with workforce and staffing issues, having operational um, and administrative responsibilities. They have a kind of a unique view into that holistic look into the buildings. And so through the course of, a, of, a, of two surveys that were done over the last few years, um, we've dug in and we've wanted to better understand how the factors are that are impacting the ability to prioritize and to actually invest in technology in these spaces. And so I wanted to share some of this, these findings with you here today. Um, we're going to start with, uh, through the premise of assuming that the value of the technology is appealing, first of all. Um, there's a lot that's being developed in our space today, um, and not all of it is uh, right or appropriate, or just because it's cool doesn't mean it's going to be the right fit. Um, so assuming that the value is appealing, then the factors that we're learning about, um, number one is cost. Now, when you get in and dig into cost, it's not just about the straight up cost of the hardware and the software, but there's all the other costs associated with subscriptions, with the time it takes to train staff, um, ongoing support, um, costs associated with perhaps in, um, increased data security. Um, and we need to understand and think about how those new costs are accounted for. If they're part of a, a capital cost or if they need to be built into the ongoing operational costs of a building um, and where the funding comes from to pay for those things which really leads us into that next column around commitment. And as Justin mentioned earlier around defining who the stakeholders are that have a vested interest in um, seeing technology implemented because the return on the investment of that, um, inv uh, those, that technology will benefit them as well. And I think we historically, we've seen a lot of the cost burden land on the shoulders of the operators. Um, where we're starting to see more interest from uh, REITs, real estate, and trust, uh, real estate uh, investment trust groups, um, more interest from um, the owners, the um, insurance companies that um, you know, do the underwriting for these organizations have more of a vested interest in the outcomes where technology can actually either help to drive down operational costs or drive down um, insurance claims and that may be willing, um, if invited to, be a part of the stakeholder uh, team and plan when you're thinking about tech investments in your communities. Um, and then finally, the, around the consumer as well and the impact that tech investments um, have on both you know, staff, resident, and family. Um, Justin, can you talk a little bit more about these areas as well? Because I know that through the interactions that you have in, when you're out in buildings and walking buildings and meeting with different teams, um, how you're seeing these research findings kind of come to life um, in reality. Can you share a few examples? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, as we're thinking through these, I mean, I think there are some, you know, we think about maybe direct impact to, you know, maybe the resident, um, but we're not necessarily thinking about, all right, well, what does the family member need? Um, you know, what are the downstream impacts of some of these things? So, um, you know, there's all sorts of examples here of, you know, technology that was brought in to solve one problem, but had these better, you know, downstream benefits to the families. Um, and so, you know, there's examples of, of everything from, um, you know, I think that what we've seen on kind of the falls monitoring side of, you know, a focus on reducing the risk inside the building. And so to Liz's point, you know, you have insurance agencies that are interested, you have the operators themselves that are interested, but now you have data that you can provide um, to help improve the resident's quality of life. So understand, you know, maybe why these falls are happening in the first place. How can we redesign that room to actually reduce that impact for that, you know, for that resident? And now, like, how do we have better data to actually take back to the family? 
So instead of the family getting a, you know, a call from their loved one or something else of, you know, I had a fall and I was on the floor for, for four hours before anybody actually showed up to, to take care of me, you know, now we actually can have data behind the scenes to say, listen, like, here's why that fall happened. Um, here's exactly how long, you know, that, that resident was on the floor. They were on the floor for, you know, four minutes before we had someone actually show up to, to care for them. Um, and, and here's what we're doing to prevent that issue from happening, you know, down the line. And so I think there's this kind of transparency of process that a lot of this technology can bring that, you know, family members are sitting there and they're, they're not sure who to trust when they're hearing things, right? Um, because so much is, is based off of, well, we're getting data from, from the, the caregiver, but we love our loved one. And so we trust what they tell us. Um, but there's, there's not always, you know, that's not always the way it works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think some, some other examples that are out there are, you know, even putting some kind of automation in place of, you know, just giving updates. Um, so I talked to a group the other day um, that their focus is on integrating um, between the kind of clinical systems and the communication to uh, family members of, you know, whether it's a medication change, it's activities that a loved one are doing and things like that, and, and automating that whole process. And so how do you take some of that burden off of a, a caregiver or a clinician, but now automate that process so that the family on the, on the back end gets, you know, near real-time updates as to exactly what's happening within a community or, you know, a healthcare change of condition that happened, or even just, hey, here's what, you know, loved one had for lunch, here's some activities that they did today, um, those types of things. So I think we're seeing more and more things that that we understand it can both save time internally and provide a better value and better impact to the residents, to the families, you know, kind of down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I, you know, I think that uh, this, this outlines the complexity of the tech investment space in a way that um, we need to continue to talk with each other about these things because we're learning. I love, I loved what Megan shared earlier around the um, the outcomes that Link Seniors finding, and the um, the work that they've done to bring that evidence forward. Um, that is such important information for tech developers to bring to us, to bring to the industry, so that we can better understand how all these things kind of fit together um, to create a more holistic approach. Um, which allows other groups to better understand as well, other stakeholders in the, um, including policymakers and including um, others in that stakeholder continuum. Um, I wanted to just uh, touch a little bit on the issue around commitment. And um, in the center of this column here, there's a, a point around solving usability issues um, and burdens. And Justin, if we can go to the next slide, I wanted to just uh, dig into this just a little bit. So one of the um, elements that's come out of the research we, we've been doing is a better understanding of what the experiences with prior technology investments have been at the center level. And what we're learning and understanding from both the research we've done as well as um, other researchers have, um, have found similar findings that without proper um, infrastructure without proper um, education and commitment to ongoing use, that there are a number of usability issues that end up um, impacting the ability for us to really uh, achieve the true value of the tech that was invested in in the first place. So this, you know, this idea that, oh, if we just, you know, get our electronic health record in, that's going to save our staff time and it's going to um, improve care. Um, research is showing that without um, this ongoing support uh, for ongoing training and education and support for the frontline caregivers, that those that value is not being realized. And in some ways is actually adding more burden and, and more workarounds and more cost to um, the infrastructure than we had in the first place. And so it's, uh, it's more about more than just getting the tech in the building. And, um, and that's, I love what Link, um, Link Senior does here with these webinars is um, creating opportunities for you to learn from each other as well. Um, those are the ways that we find um, support and infrastructure to continue that ongoing best, best practice use. So I wanted to share a little bit with you about how we think about what value does tech offer. And I wanted to share this with you as if you are involved in looking at technology or involved in assessing tech for your building. 
some ways to think about the jobs that that technology is actually going to be able to help you with. So if we if we think about the, the there's this theory that our engineers um, use called the jobs to be done theory. And it really um, takes the view that all jobs are processes. And if you can understand how to break down those, you know, the jobs into those processes, that we can start to see where tech can actually make um, a difference and where it can add real value. Um, and so, that the value and the, the return on investment that um, our team has focused on historically has been around, does it help us reduce cost? Is it labor savings? Is it you know, time savings? Is it, you know, what is it um, that helps us reduce costs? Does it help us with improving outcomes, demonstrably improving outcomes? Um, Link Senior um, in, has evidence now that shows that they're improving cognitive function and reducing the use of antipsychotics. Those are demonstrably improved outcomes. Um, does it, or does it create new revenue or does it optimize existing revenue for an operator in a way that allows them to then think about how they're gonna invest, um, reinvest in the building then as well. So let's look at an example of this. And I wanted to share an example of a technology um, around as a nurse, I'm, go, I'm gonna use a vital sign monitor as an example here, but um, a few years back, we looked at, um, we have a group of nursing, nursing executives, the one I mentioned earlier, that helps us with, um, that helps us with understanding these jobs and these processes. And one of the areas that we dug in around was taking vital signs and the challenges with taking vital signs and getting that information accurately and, and into the medical record on a timely basis. Oftentimes we would hear reports of, you know, the CNAs getting vitals done, um, but they were too busy and they couldn't get them documented till the end of the shift. Um, we heard reports of nurses then that when they were going to pass meds and if they didn't have the updated vitals at that time, sometimes they had to redo the vitals. So, um, so as we're breaking down all these processes, we wanted to try to develop a technology that would actually be able to check the boxes on um, you know, around these different jobs and around these different processes. Um, and so through the development of um, a middleware technology that integrates with the largest um, uh, electronic health record groups in our space today, um, we've been able to demonstrate and document um, time and labor savings up to 40% of the time that um, historically had been spent taking vitals and documenting vitals um, improved accuracy um, in optimizing clinical decision making because they have accurate vitals that were documented at the time that they were taken. Um, and, um, and that the staff that's taking vitals has um, access to the to good information about the resident. Their last vitals, they're able to pull up their um, their information, you know, right at the bedside and able to make sure that if they're getting a really wacky reading that there's an alert and a, and a process in place that um, helps us helps them with decision making. Um, and finally, staff satisfaction with um, improved abilities to be able to get their get their jobs done in a way that frees up more time and reduces the, the stress um, involved in those steps. And so it's a, an example of one place and one type of job that um, as we think about breaking down what the, um, where the opportunities are um, to see value um, become clear. Um, and so as we, as we think about then kind of the bigger picture around is, the, is value being realized? Um, I wanted to share a few findings that have come out of this research as well, um, where we know that the prior experiences that staff are having with, with their technology that's already been invested in, that it does inform how value is being realized. And um, if the staff lose confidence in the technology because it's not working, because you have spotty Wi-Fi, because um, somebody forgot to plug it in and charge it, you know, those things matter. And having processes and a change management process around it um, that helps to solve some of those usability issues. Um, really, really do matter. And so um, having a process in place that considers how the technology is being utilized, if it's being utilized to its fullest capacity, um, is an important part of an overall quality assurance program in a community. Um, and those are some findings I think that are important for us to, 
understand and talk about, not just at the center level, but at all levels of the stakeholders, including the technology developers themselves. So how well are they understanding the impact of um, how the tech is being utilized at, at, the, um, at the center level? And where is their responsibility in that chain of events to make sure that they're continuing to develop and evolve and um, evolve their services in a way that are responsive to your needs? Um, we're learning that stakeholders measure value differently and that these owners and insurers are, that are becoming more invested in tech, um, they really wanna see you know, that it demonstrates that risk is being reduced. We're seeing either a reduction in falls or reductions in injuries um, that translates into reduction in claims. And so if that matters to them, then how can they help an operator with offsetting some of the costs associated with implementing some of this technology? Um, we're learning that operators are really, fe really feeling the strain of, quote, too much tech that is not integrated or interoperable. And that that is a problem that more and more technology without um, a solution around it to help better um, integrate and create more interoperability will continue to feel burdensome to providers. And so for us to have better clarity around this has been really important and powerful and important for us to be able to share this with other tech developers as well that are designing and developing for tech in our space. Um, and that, you know, their tech developers are being challenged to deliver more value without adding more cost. If everything requires another subscription fee or adds another cost to the end user, to the operator, we're going to see less and less tech being able to be implemented. And so we've got to figure out new ways, new ways to fund, new ways to invest, new ways to bring more of the stakeholders to the table that all have a vested interest in this working. We can go to and the I, next slide, Justin. I was going to say, and I was just going to add on this one, I think one of the, the big asks of, of the industry from the technology side is to be vocal in that feedback. So when we think about the interoperability and, and the, the you know, negative impact that can have um, when you have too much tech that doesn't talk to each other, um, or just tech developers building something without necessarily a feedback mechanism to the end users, um, that becomes a huge challenge. And so um, realizing that you know, everybody has more work than they have hours in the day, um, but as some of these groups reach out and they're looking for feedback on solutions, um, it's very important for, for all of us who are involved in this to be able to be open and honest with our feedback back to these groups, um, because it's the only way that we're going to, you know, fundamentally get to the end of a, of a solution that that fills the needs um, and, and you know, is, is easy to drop in place and actually provide that value. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can we go, go. So, um, so we asked the question before around, we'd love to, we'd love to dig in a little bit here, Megan, and um, if, if you're seeing any um, answers here or things that um, kind of answer this question, how is engagement tech changing the way care is delivered in your center? Um, we'd love to talk about that for a few minutes, um, and then we're going to um, kind of finish up our conversation about talking about the evolution of artificial intelligence. Excellent. That sounds good. So everyone in the webinar room uh, in the chat box, if you can please go ahead and answer this question if you haven't done so already. And while they're doing that, Liz and Justin, we did have a couple of comments and questions come in, some of which you touched on already. So I'll just um, run through these quickly to see if you have comment. Um, from Tasha here, she does say, I feel that all technology possible will not change the systemic problem of constant shortages of staffing and low pay unless technology can provide residents with their daily care needs. Is there any technology example of how to address these never ending issues? Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, that it's a huge question, right? That has more than one answer, I think, to it. And um, I'm of the belief that we will need more alignment through um, those that have the means to support the funding for some of these things to really make meaningful change. Um, when, I look, when I look and see the, the number of um, Medicare beneficiaries that are signing up for Medicare Advantage plans, and we've seen, we're seeing more and more, I think we're north of 50% of all beneficiaries now are in these plans. What is the role that these insurers take on then in their desire to see um, more value, more um, positive outcomes, 
um, you know, the responsibilities that they may have to help with some of this, which may require government intervention to do. And we've had those conversations with our government relations team um, in thinking and talking about where there's, um, where there's reform issues that are gonna be necessary uh, going forward. Um, I think it also extends to technologies that are um, impacting the lives of the caregivers themselves. Um, you know, I think about the role that, um, I was just on a webinar the other day, maybe some of you were on it, um, where CMS um, is starting a new demonstration project um, with dementia care um, providers that will allow for um, physicians in particular to be able to uh, bill for dementia care um, services in certain, in certain settings, including um, assisted living settings. And, um, and, you know, how do those funding mechanisms start to change the way that technology can um, play a role in this? And so this, this demonstration model will also include dollars um, available to provide respite services. And so for caregivers who are caring for a loved one at home, for instance, um, you know, will they be able to partner with an assisted living um, organization that allows for them to have a place to um, provide some respite services for their loved ones so that they can get a break? I, that kind of innovative thinking and innovations around payer source will become more and more important for us to understand where technology could play a role in some of that. How do we learn about the opportunity? Where do caregivers get plugged into it? How do we disseminate information? So I think that there's a lot to come yet, um, but I'm hopeful that um, the, the sheer volume of aging, um, people that are aging are will affect this affect change in ways that have perhaps seemed slow and frustrating um, to many of us who've done been in this space for a lot of years, but I do think that you know change is coming. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Liz. And uh, while you were answering the question, we've had a lot of responses come in for this question on the screen here. So I'll just run through a handful. Lori says, our vitals machine downloads directly to our computer system. Mm -hmm. uh, Lito says, Ma um, management needs to be on board to improve systems. Uh, Pam says, it has given us a 24 seven option for engagement with less time spent in facilitating by off shift staff. Um, mm -hmm. We have point click care and the CNA can now put vitals directly into the chart as you spoke of, that is helping them a lot. Uh, let's see here, engagement technology is enhancing how residents and staff's lives are being transformed. It's amazing. Uh, Jake says technology allows us to delegate certain tasks via tech and will give caregivers mm -hmm. more bedside time. Uh, Vicky says, making our patients more aware of their care and giving them options and information through patient portals. Love it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love, I love that when you're put, giving more power back to residents, right, and their families and finding ways to create more agency for them. Um, and I think those are the things that, as providers, that we have to continue to be those advocates for those things that make that kind of a difference because that becomes a demonstrable ROI, I, I believe as well. Um, and people will be become more demanding of that, I think in the future too. Absolutely, awesome, awesome reading through all these yeah. updates and, and what's working and, and even some of the people that are saying, you know, listen, like we're not investing in technology at the moment, or we're not seeing a lot of change. And it's something that we need to focus on. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's awesome. Um, so knowing that we have, you know, just a, a little bit of time remaining, um, you know, I am going to give you, this is maybe the 30,000 foot view uh, whirlwind tour of, of kind of the involving impact of, of artificial intelligence and, and how we're looking at the application of artificial intelligence within healthcare. Um, you know, I think that, that you have multiple sides of the equation here. I think you have people who are fearful of artificial intelligence and the role that it's going to play. And I think you have people that are optimistic um, around this is gonna make life easier, uh, make life better for, for everyone. Um, but I think as, as we look at it, um, and this is a, a great quote that we found that was ultimately, you know, just the, the, the application of artificial intelligence within healthcare 
you know, could save five to 10% of our US healthcare spending today. That's 200 to $360 billion a year um, just by kind of applying artificial intelligence and getting some of these economies of scale, um, more efficiencies, more effectiveness in our kind of healthcare system. And so when we're talking about healthcare, I think there's a lot of, of ways that we think about it. Um, you know, when I think about artificial intelligence and, and how it's going to play there, you know, I think about it from a data perspective of we're talking about all these solutions that we're bringing into a building. So we're talking about cameras, we're talking about sensors, we're talking about all, the, all of these different things. And one of the things we talked about before is these are all desperate systems and they're not necessarily talking to each other. So artificial intelligence is one of the things that we can actually use the application of to make sense out of that chaos. So we have data coming in from all of these sources. The more and more data that's coming in, the less and less I can just put it in front of a person and expect them to make sense out of it. And so as we think about artificial intelligence, it's how do I make sense out of the chaos? How do I take all of these data feeds that are coming in? And how do I make sure that I'm only looking at the ones that need my attention, right? So here's the outliers. Here's a resident that, you know, for the last three weeks, they've been on their baseline and everything's been great. But man, something has happened the last two days that their behaviors are changing, that their activity levels are changing, other things are changing for them. And I actually need to focus my attention there um, because they're probably the greatest risk um, that I have today of some negative impact. And so we call some of these like clinical decision-making tools, right? So it's, it's pulling data in, it's turning it into a, a focused effort for clinicians to say, listen, you have a hundred people in your building. Here's the five that you should actually pay attention to today um, because something is going on with them. So it's not necessarily getting to the point of diagnostics, but it's saying something is changing. Here's some information about what has changed for them in the last few days. We probably need to go in and check and, and see what's happening there. So as we think about that type of application, I think there's a few things that, that people are, are worried about. I think that, you know, the big three that, that we kind of talk about are safety, security, and transparency. You know, one, are we using this information in the right way? Is there a, a, a downside of using this information? Are we putting resident safety at risk by bringing artificial intelligence into the equation? Totally legitimate question. And we need to have answers for those as we're looking at these applications. Security becomes a big piece. We're bringing all of this data in and now all of my healthcare data and, and, and all this information about me um, as a healthcare recipient um, is now in one place. Um, what's the security around that? I don't want that you know, available to people who shouldn't have access. Um, so great, security, let's dive into that one and understand more. And then I think the final one that for me is actually the largest one is just transparency. So how do we give transparency into the data that we're collecting? How we're using this data? How we're turning it into actions? Because I think the scariest thing for a lot of folks is when it's just a black box, right? The data goes in one side and, and some you know, action or activity comes out of the other side. And I don't know how it's making sense of what happens in the middle. And I think that's scary for, for healthcare providers. I think it can be scary for residents. It can be scary for family members. And so the more transparency that we can actually provide and show like, here is what we're doing. Here is how we're taking that data and turning it into action. Then, you know, the better we're, we're kind of all at. The, the other piece that we talked about here and, and you know, the question that, that just came up talking about, you know, the impact that we have on staffing is already an issue. Um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is, is regulatory impact, right? So regulation drives a lot of things in this industry. And so how do we work with the regulators to say, listen, there's new technology that's coming out that can maybe change some of the ways that we regulate the delivery of healthcare. So if we're talking about staffing minimums, if we're talking about other things, hey, if we apply technology in the right way, can it actually change some of these regulations moving forward? Now, obviously we all know, you know, government, not exactly the quickest mover uh, when it comes to these types of things. But these are ongoing conversations that we're having and hoping um, that, you know, we can have some of the um, the folks who are in charge and, and putting these regulations in place, you know, change a bit of their, their thinking practice. So as we think about this application of AI and the kind of buildings of the future, um, you know, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning. You know, we talked about voice technology. We talked about some of these different sensors. The honest answer is we're going to see combinations of all of these different things, you know, start coming into the buildings. Um, you know, wearable sensors are certainly something that um, is becoming a larger and larger focus, um, whether that's, 
um, you know, a, a smartwatch that is becoming more and more common for everybody or some of these things is just a patch that you stick on and it communicates for you know, a week before it falls off. Um, all of these things we're gonna see more and more of. And I think you know, to the previous point, how is this data coming together? How are we turning it into actionable insights that help us um, run the community, deliver healthcare, all of these things more effectively and more efficiently? And specifically the, the ask around, you know, how does some of this technology help us become more effective? You know, we talk about the jobs to be done piece. I also think about just what are the individual tasks? So when we're looking at automation, we're looking at technology, you know, I'm not looking at it from the standpoint of wanting to replace a person, right? The honest answer is I can't replace a person because a person can do anything. They can, you know, drop something in a moment's notice, move over, focus on something different. And so there's not really a technology out there that can replace that. But I can replace some of the tasks that take up time. And so as we look at the tasks that are being done, what tasks are value added to the caregiver? What tasks are value added to the residents? Um, and how do we keep those in place, but then automate the other stuff? And so, you know, as we're thinking about that, all of these pieces come together to this infrastructure within the building that acts as another tool to deliver healthcare um, to the residents within. And so I'm gonna pass it back to Liz. I know we're, we wanna get a couple of questions in here. Um, but this kind of brings us back to the to the beginning. Yeah, Justin, thank you. And um, so, you know, just revisiting that idea around that building as caregiver. Um, I'd, if you're interested in using this and sharing this, um, Justin, we can go to the next slide. I, yep. I wanted to leave you, make sure we left you with um, a few ideas around readiness for rapid change within your own organization. Um, and what I call many organizations are familiar with either a compliance or governance group or maybe a quality governance group um, or a data governance group. What I would encourage is that is thinking around a, a defined tech government governance team, which is responsible collectively for looking at how tech is being used in your communities. This isn't just the job of the of the IT department. Um, that there's stakeholders across the spectrum that have something to say here. And um, whether it's about the tech you've already got in place in the building, how well everyone understands how it's being used, if it's being used to its maximum potential, um, if your, um, what your plan is for the future as far as um, getting new technology and how you're gonna prioritize what you're gonna be investing in. And so um, I really encourage um, operators, owners, people who are in leadership positions to take on that mantle. Someone mentioned earlier about the importance of having the leadership team um, sponsoring and supporting this. And so feel free to share this and roll this up to your team, to your leadership team, if you like. But this kind of work is really critical right now for organizations to be um, putting teams together and to be thinking about what the future will look like. I would encourage you to think about including residents and their families on your team, frontline caregivers and staff, um, any of the people who are gonna be impacted by it and including tech developers as well. So, um, and we are um, committed to continuing to use our voices and the relationships that we have at the, through our government relations team and through the different associations to continue to try to drive these messages um, to and through them as well. So hoping that these are some, some good takeaway Takeaways for you, um, Justin, I'll turn it back over to you. And um, we have just a couple things we wanted to wrap up with. And then if anybody does have a final question. Yeah, so we'll share these slides. Um, we have some resources that we use um, that are, are linked in here. So you can go in here. Um, if there's other resources that you use, share them in chat. Um, mm -hmm. It's a benefit for, for everyone. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, really the, the, the role in the group that you know, Liz and I work with, you know, we're tied on bringing all of these pieces together. So looking at, at the solution makers, looking at the researchers, looking at the caregivers um, and bringing them all together to, to find solutions. So, um, you know, as you're kind of going through uh, and trying to find new solutions to existing problems, use us as a resource, you know, to Liz's point. Um, we're more than happy to share our insights, um, the things that we have, have gone into in, in research um, and share them back in, into this community. And so I think they're going to you know, we'll share some of our contact information as well here. Um, and I think that's where that's where we'll end it. If there's, you know, additional questions, um, we can certainly handle those. But we, you know, we thank everybody for the, the good dialogue today.
Yes, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I love the interaction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz and Justin. Well, I think you can see here, you've sparked a lot of conversation in the webinar room chat box. And so if you would stop your share, I'll actually put your yep. email addresses up on the screen because I think there's some questions we won't be able to get to today, but I do wanna encourage people if they'd like to contact you, they can do that here. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, just wanted to thank you so much for sharing your insights, sharing these resources, and we hope to keep this conversation going and our activity strong. Uh, private Facebook group. So I encourage people to sign up and, and keep the conversation going there. And uh, I put some links in the webinar room chat box for anyone who wants to come to some of our upcoming events, including our upcoming Decoding Dementia Gathering on September 5th. So with that, uh, thank you again, Liz and Justin, and we will look forward to seeing everyone in September. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.